Okay, I'm glad you're all here. Uh, again, my name is Dave Weed. I live in Warren. Anybody recognize Burrs Hill Park? Across from the town beach on Water Street. Um, my house is back in those trees there. And like I said, uh, I've lived there for 40 years now. But did I get to know anything about where I live? No, I spent all my time in Fall River. Um, but I retired. A couple years ago, you know, I see some smiles. That's what happens, it's retirement disease. Oh, I've got time, I can do things now. And at the same time I retired, they started digging a hole in Brazil Park. All right? To rebury the Massasoit, Osamequin. And that's where he lies today. I had some early interest in the history of the King Philip War, and did a website about 15 years ago. So I thought I knew everything I needed to know. And it was good. I got to learn about some of the sites around here. And how many people feel like you know a good deal about the King Philip War? No? Well, we'll have to do another talk about that sometime. But there's lots out there about the King Philip's War. Not a whole lot about what led up to it, not a whole lot about what happened afterwards. So we're not going to talk about the war today. We're going to talk about what happened before and what happened after. We will stay with the 17th century, however. I did get involved in uh, replacking uh, the Hugh Cole Well, which even most people in Warren have never been to. Have you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's behind the Kickapoo Middle School on the bike path, and nobody can get to it because it's a long walk. Uh, but we're going to build a new bridge there shortly, uh, in the next couple of years. And that bike path will go across the Kikimio River and right across the bridge you will find uh, this a monument there to the first person to settle in Warren in 1653. Somebody who grew up in Plymouth was born there and grew up and moved over here and uh, has quite a unique history of his own. I also had met Helen Jader. Anybody know her? No? Oh, good. Okay. She's a, a, a Barrington resident for quite a number of years and uh, was involved in land conservation issues, but also had an interest in the history of this area. And she gave a presentation at the Barrington Preservation Society and said, uh, we ought to start a Soames Heritage Area. So that's how I got involved. Let me take you to a video of her. It's a story still in the making of those who have gone before us, of generations living now, and of generations yet to come. But welcome to Soames, the heartland of the Poconoke tribe of the Wampanoag Nation and Algonquin people. Traditionally, we might start by looking at a map, yet every map has its limitations. This map was developed by Bicknell, a Barrington resident. All of modern Barrington, Warren, Bristol, parts of East Providence, Seekonk, Rehoboth, Swansea, and Somerset are part of Soams per this interpretation. An alternative is to reflect not only on the land, but also on the water and on the sky to reach a new appreciation of this place by looking to the natural cycles. It's been estimated that the Wampanoag peoples lost up to 90% of their population in a devastating wave of epidemics from 1617 to 1619. The pilgrims ventured to establish their colony in the wake of this devastation. Population losses differed across indigenous populations who were not affected simultaneously or equally creating a severe imbalance of power. In March 1621, at the time of the New Year, the Massasoit Osimiquin established a peace treaty with Plymouth Colony that lasted for over 50 years. This was the very first treaty between indigenous people and the colonists of North America. Between the national myths surrounding the first Thanksgiving in 1621 
and the 1675 to 1676 conflict known as King Philip's War, that long piece is missing from our national narrative of the interactions between the Wampanoag Nation and the settlers of Plymouth Colony and those of Providence Plantation. In the early 1990s, a group of amateur archaeologists began excavations on land that was then owned by the Rhode Island Country Club. Found items in the upper soil levels included a 1699 half cent, a copper button, and a glass stopper. Lower layers revealed many stone tools, including arrowheads, knives, scrapers, drills, hammer stones, and reamers. But they also encountered something unique in Barrington and highly unusual throughout southern New England, a cluster of crescent-shaped stone horse. In Bristol, Papa squash is believed to be a corruption of papoose and squaw. Soames Woods, Barrington, was a similar area set aside for women and for childbirth, a place of peace. And thanks to the work of many partners, Soames Woods is again a place of peace, with hiking trails open to the public and fishing access to Echo Lake. The property that could best express this heritage and contribute to a rebalancing of our commemorations lacks permanent protection and has limited public access. Potuntuk, the lookout, also known as Montop or Mount Hope, although these are likely names used by settlers, is in Bristol. It includes King Philip's seat and the spring where Metacom was killed. It can be argued that Soames is the pivotal place of cultural exchange between indigenous people and colonizing settlers in North America. Few people realize that there was a peace treaty between the Poconoke tribe and the Puritans established around March 21, 1621, which lasted over 50 years. One idea to consider is the establishment of a Soames National Heritage District, which could provide a framework for an appreciation of Soames and the role of the Poconoke in the heritage of our country. A Soams district could provide an encompassing approach featuring the essential cultural, natural, scenic, historic, and recreational open spaces of Soams in a way that celebrates this layered history for residents and draws new visitors. If we begin now, we could ensure that the Soams Heritage District is well established before the 400th anniversary of the peace treaty in 2021. Well, uh, I'm going to fill in a few of the details, and this is primarily what I've learned in the last two years um, in uh, looking at this place. As, as Helen said, uh, Psalms, which translates loosely as the southern area, okay, uh, is in fact the southern area of the tribal area occupied. You're, you're going to expect I'm going to say the Wampanoags, but I'm going to say the Poconokans because the name Wampanoag didn't appear anywhere until 1702. Okay. Prior to that time, all the maps and references to the tribe were to Poconoke, and I'll explain later why that name disappeared. Okay. Uh, their territory went all the way up to the Charles River, where the Mass uh, Massachusetts tribes were, uh, along the Nipmuc, territory, um, included Providence until somewhere around the early 1600s uh, because the Narragansetts principally occupied the southern area of Rhode Island, or what is today Rhode Island, and their territory also included both Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. Notice it did not include the Cape, and I'll tell you more about that. So this area consisted of, uh, actually the count varies, I've got 31 subtribes here, it could be as many as 60. You've got to uh, realize that what's happened is that any place there was a settlement, of, kind of think of an extended family, that was a tribe, and those tribes moved around, they would elect a chief, uh, but the chiefs would change over time in one thing or another. But What's common about them is that they were under the leadership of Massasoits, 
not just the one we know of, Osamequin, but also a whole chain of massasoids going back, as far as we know, thousands of years. Um, there were shifting alliances over time, but at the time that the pilgrims arrived, uh, it was clear that the Massasoit Osamequin was the leader of this whole group of tribes. Um, these folks had been living here for 10, perhaps as much as 12,000 years. We know simply because that's when the glaciers receded from this area and humans could occupy it. We presume that they did. Some of the earliest uh, archaeological remains go back about 8,000 years. Um, so it's not hard to extrapolate at least another couple thousand years of human occupation of all of New England, okay, around this area. Um, and as far as we know, they lived a very successful life. We don't have an extensive history, but we don't have any evidence of um, huge die-offs or um, people leaving the area or things of that sort. Until some visitors came, some people from across the ocean um, who decided to come and trade for things uh, um, that the people living in these villages uh, might want to have. And in fact, they did. Uh, in particular, uh, they traded something that was cheap and easy for them to find, which was furs, at least initially, uh, for things that the English had that were also cheap and easy to come by, uh, knives, uh, beads, uh, glass beads, uh, woven fabric, things of that sort, that the native people would want to have. Things changed just before the pilgrims came in a big way, and we have eyewitness accounts of this event. As far as we know, it's the only time that it happened, in, um, or the first time it happened, not the only time, uh, along the coast when 90% of the population along the coast of what's now Massachusetts, down to about this area, it, it didn't seem to affect people quite as much here, and the Narragansett tribe across the bay uh, didn't experience this. But this was a series of uh, infectious diseases that killed 90% of people over a three year period of time. Uh, we don't know exactly what those diseases are. They could be one of several, but you think of an infectious disease, it could have been one of them. Um, even the plague, um, hepatitis, uh, uh, there have been speculations. The first one is always about smallpox, uh, measles, which can be deadly to a population that had no exposure. Whatever occurred, that outbreak um, decimated, literally, one out of 10 is what decimate means, 90% uh, um, of the population. Uh, and the accounts of Somerset, who had been taken out of the area and came back to his village of Patuxent, that we know as Plymouth, discovered no one alive in this village, not one person. Okay. It's conceivable some of them may have gotten out of there in time. But what they did find was uh, bleached bones, human bones, remains in a village site um, because people died at such a rate there was no one alive to bury their own dead. That was not just a population loss, but it was a culture loss because their culture was carried in the elders who were there, and it was also a loss of their uh, defense ability. Their warriors, okay, were dead now. And it left uh, the Massasoit with a terrible problem on his hands. When the pilgrims did arrive, they were a sorry lot, right? Um, you, so have you ever read the account of uh, Verrazano, of his first visit here in uh, uh, 1427 or so? Uh, where he described the people as tall, robust, lusty, okay? The women were attractive. You know, this is a group of European uh, shipmates, okay? Who were mostly about five feet tall, 
uh, living on beer and biscuits, okay, uh, teeth rotting out, uh, disease ridden, okay, uh, not a handsome lot, okay, who came upon this group uh, who were very friendly to them and came and visited them. Uh, Verrazano's crew also traveled as far as 15 miles inland at several locations, right, right along the coast here, okay, 40, 42nd latitude. We know he was here in Narragansett Bay and reported not what I had originally thought, which would be large virgin forests with huge oak and chestnut trees, but open, cleared land. Okay. We'll talk a little bit more about how that happened. So here's the massasoit Osamequin. This is a likeness. This is the statue that you find down in Plymouth. It's probably the best known likeness. Uh, what I prefer is Ruth the Wild Major's uh, painting, a uh, more recent painting she did of the Massasoit, who's a little less uh, stern and warlike, uh, but also wearing a red horseman's jacket that he was given, uh, and it's recorded uh, in the English uh, accounts, Mort's Relation, uh, uh, by Ed Winslow and, and Governor Carter at the time, and something he highly prized, uh, included a um, a gold lace along the edge and a, a copper necklace there. Those items were found in a grave in Brazil. The plot thickens. Um, well, faced with the potential an, uh, annihilation of his tribe by the Narragansetts, actually it's not so much that the tribes would kill each other, but they simply take over someone, another tribe's territory and incorporate everybody into their tribe. So you lose your tribal identity, you take on a new tribe, okay? And there was a lot of exchange back and forth over the years between these two tribes, but the Massasoit wanted to defend his uh, land uh, in Somes and Somes uh, because of its rich, bounteous nature, when you think about uh, what we have here in terms of access to water, uh, which provides food year-round, and then hunting inland, it was one of the best places to live. And the Massasoit did not want to give it up. So his strategy was to form an alliance with Governor Carver. And they had a meeting uh, after a disastrous winter. Remember, they got here in December, and uh, by the following March, 50 of them had died out of the, out of the 102. Uh, hopefully not one of your relatives. Um, so the Massasoit knew that this group wasn't exactly a robust fighting force. However, they had something that no one else had. Guns, okay? Guns and cannons. Uh, so he formed a, a, a treaty, an alliance, with the governor, um, and that treaty uh, is celebrated in a coin. Uh, has anybody seen the Sacagawea coin? You remember that? Okay, came out about 20 years ago. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> piece of crap. <laughs> uh, flip it over, and you'll find the Wampanoag Treaty celebrated there. Okay, that's the only place that I know of where the U.S. government has ever acknowledged the Wampanoag Treaty. And the Poconoca tribe today said they got it all wrong. There weren't any Wampanoags. And it should say Poconoca Treaty. But we've got the coin. What can we do? Um, that uh, treaty became the basis of an alliance that lasted over 50 years and uh, both protected uh, the tribes uh, from incursion by uh, the uh, Narragansetts in particular but also protected the English by their sharing of knowledge of how to survive. Literally, if the Massasoits and his people had not shared their knowledge of how to survive, the English would have, either the rest of them would have died or they would have headed back to England as a failure, okay? Um, in fact, if the Massasoit wanted to kill them all, he could have. It wasn't that hard. They had done it with a French ship that had come in about three years earlier. Um, but he decided to welcome them, and he then 
appointed his ambassador, uh, uh, um, Ed Winslow, uh, to go meet with them. Um, Winslow, this is a, a contemporary painting, so we have a pretty good idea, idea that's what he looked like. He, this is down at Pilgrim Hall in, in Plymouth, if you want to see it. Um, and uh, his job was to kind of seal the deal. Uh, so he went to visit Massasoit in his home. Now you have to ask the question of where was the Massasoit actually living? Anybody want to take a guess? No? No guesses? Bristol? Huh? Not Bristol, yeah, because that, that was Mount Hope, and a lot of people identify that. Uh, his son, uh, Philip, uh, occupied the Mount Hope Peninsula, and actually a little further north of there. Uh, but we don't know exactly where the Massasoit was, but this, there's two speculations. Uh, Guy Pheasanton in 1855 wrote that it must have been Warren, uh, because there was a spring in Warren that was called the Massasoit Spring. Thereby, the Massasoit must have been there. Okay. Uh, so much for tradition. And, and then Virginia Baker, uh, toward the turn of the, the end of the 19th century, uh, backed them up with more books and one thing or another, and they dedicated the spring. You can go over and see this today. There's no water there, but there's a site for the spring. But then, how many people have seen the Massasoit Spring in Barrington? Yeah, okay. Uh, you want to explain where it is? Uh, it's on uh, Ketchup and Ketchup. Uh, Thank you. I, <laughs> you're doing a better job than I would have done yeah, right. saying that name. Yeah. Yeah, Rumstick Point. Rumstick Point. Point. Okay. Uh, and there's a similar spring, and you can go there and take a look at that. So here we have two towns, each competing for their designation as the home of the Massive Study. Um, but uh, wherever it was, uh, Ed Winslow uh, decided to pay the Massasoit a visit in um, 1621 uh, in July, um, just about 400 years from next July, okay? And uh, he decided that uh, uh, best to see him where he was, he, he uh, took uh, 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 a guide, a, a native guide with him, and walked the two days from Plymouth down here, met with the Massasoit. The whole story is well described in Mort's relation, and I recommend it as a good read. It's only about two or three pages, but a lot of detail about how he traveled, where he went, where he camped, uh, you know, uh, what he heard, and about the miserable night he spent with us in Equin because he had to sleep in a wee two filled with fleas, this was in, in July. He was not very comfortable and says I didn't get a good night's sleep and they decided to uh, hightail it out and come back. But the most important thing was that he made the connection and uh, learned more about the Massasoit in his own home. Um, two years later, we get an account that uh, he made another trip down here uh, in uh, 1623 probably in March, uh, because he had heard that the Massasoit was ill, and deathly ill, and he was afraid that they might lose him. So he wanted to at least come down and see him in his final days, if he could. Again traveled down here, again met with people, heard the news ahead of time that the Massasoit was dead, until someone then corrected that and said, no, he's still alive, you can go visit him. Came to where he was, found him in his we too, um, surrounded by his people who were moaning and wailing uh, about this, uh, their chief, the great leader, uh, being on death's doorstep. Well, Winslow did what any good English leader would do because they had no doctors at the time. You administered the best uh, con concoctions that you could come up with. He scraped his tongue. Uh, he he uh, uh, ordered a uh, that a chicken be brought from from Plymouth so he could make some chicken soup for him. No, chicken never got there. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, the Massasoit recovers. Actually, the chicken got there. He decided, got there late. He decided to keep the chicken. Yes. <laughs> right. So that's how chickens got yeah. the stones. They had never seen chickens before. Uh, but the, 
given that uh, the master slave recovered, uh, he embraced Winslow and said, we'll be friends for life. And he meant it. Okay, he kept that promise. Uh, so that's the two visits to Psalms that we know about. There could have been others. Uh, they simply aren't recorded. Well, if you wonder, uh, yep. Winslow reports that on his trip from Plymouth to Soames, he actually went by some of the villages where the bleached out bones were uh, located. Yes, right. Yeah, it was a, it was a devastating thing. And when you think about it, uh, uh, the uh, the the fact that the pilgrims arrived in this vacant village. Uh, and their assumption was that God had cleared the way for them. Uh, but they, other than a few uh, Native people living on the Cape, they had very few encounters uh, with Native people. Um, and what they had heard from previous reports, uh, they expected to have a lot of trouble, uh, never materialized. Uh, so here he comes down. By the time uh, he sees Osamequin here at Soames, there are only a few hundred of the tribe people left here in the area at the time. Uh, so it wasn't, an, uh, he only had 60 warriors. Uh, it, it wasn't an overwhelming force at that point. But what they had done is cleared the land. And that's an, important to understand. Uh, this is Tyler Point. Uh, take a Google map, uh, go into Photoshop, erase all the buildings, uh, paint in some trees, and a native village here. He put in a Dutch trading ship there. Okay, um, and more than likely, something like that was going on here in Barrington. Uh, but even more likely, uh, what's now Warren was described as Brooks Pasture, meaning that it had been cleared land. Okay, and the trees had been burned off as the native people would often do twice a year, burn the forest. Uh, it cleared the land, uh, it didn't destroy the plant life. If anything, it actually improved things because it killed a lot of the insects and removed all of that scrub brush underneath the trees that made it difficult to uh, move through the forest and, and, and hunting. Um, so when the English got here, and establish the trading post somewhere right around here, in, in we think near Tyler Point, we don't know, we have no evidence. This is the Hoxie House down in the, um, on the Cape, if you want to go visit it. Um, but if you imagine somewhat <laughs> that this area looked quite a bit different than it does today, you'll get some idea of what was going on there. <laughs> One of the people who was very interested in the real estate down here was Miles Standish. He was the uh, Pilgrims' uh, military leader. And he came and visited here, loved the area, and bought property here. Uh, he was one of, the, one of the people who bought property in 1653, and probably around the uh, Kickmeo River area, um, um, possibly um, uh, where the uh, Kickmeo Middle School is. We're not entirely sure. That Records are not that clear. If you want to read them, go ahead and try to figure out where, you know, the tree is and the stream is, you know, the way they would describe things. But what was clear was that this was the kind of land that the pilgrims were looking for. Because with cleared land, you can do two things. Plant crops and graze animals. Okay. So, um, here we are with a group of people who has a very different understanding of how land is to be used. Um, the native people lived with the land, not on it, um, and actually regarded themselves as part of the land. You and your, the land you live on is the same. You are one. Think of yourself as a giant organism, if you will, uh, as well as the animals, uh, and all those things filled with spirit or vanity. It was a, a, a whole different way of understanding your environment. Whereas the English thought of land as what? Property. 
okay? Something that could be bought and sold, traded, and essentially was to be um, used or taken over, uh, not to be shared with others. Um, so the native people would manage the land and but not acquire it. And you know, at least you think that the native people's idea was uh, so environmentally correct that they never did anything to the land. No, they did lots of things. Uh, they would uh, build fish weirs uh, to, to catch fish, and very successfully with that. They would, as we mentioned before, they would clear the land with fire. Um, their, their ecology was to be uh, sustainable in terms of what was there, uh, not to use up and acquire and then move on, as the English uh, habits were. Uh, they would have uh, what's called usufruct or use agreements. You can fish here, you can hunt there, uh, and those agreements would change over time. So you might acquire hunting rights from one tribe for a period of time and then give those up in trade for water rights at, at, in another place. So that, quote, ownership, okay, the use of the land would change over time as well. Whereas in the English world, you have a deed, you specify the land, you own that entirely, you, it's yours to manage the, whatever way you want or to ruin whatever way you want, okay? Um, and uh, it was never purchased. We hear a lot about, you know, uh, um, money being exchanged or gifts of one sort or another. Well, when, when two tribes would come together and decide on the use of the land, uh, often when something was given up, you would give a gift in, as an offering, okay? Friendship gift, if you will, okay? Uh, so these friendship gifts were small in nature, you know, 35 pounds, you know, not a whole lot. And, and people say, well, the land was worth, you know, 50 times that. Well, they weren't buying the land. Eventually, the native people figured out what this whole purchase thing was about. And toward the end of the century, actually owned their own land at, at points. But the, the original clash of cultures saw land uh, in two different ways. Religion, of course, is celebrated very differently. Uh, there was no Bible or uh, prescription in terms of how worship was to be conducted. In fact, the native people worshiped every day, all day long. You lived in a spiritual world, okay? Whereas the English, you know, work six days a week and then spend all day in the in some building listening to somebody talking to you, okay? That was worship. Um, acceptance of what can't be controlled um, in the sense that Native people understood that bad things were gonna happen as well as good and that you weren't in control of that. Whereas the attempt on the part of the English was to control your world through your behavior, okay? That if you were saved, if you were good, that good things would happen to you. Guess what? Didn't work that way. Another visitor here, 1636, Roger. Okay. How many people have been to the Roger Williams Memorial in downtown uh, Providence? Good, okay. If you haven't been there recently, stop by. It only takes half an hour to walk in there and look around. Um, but uh, Roger is well known because we're in Rhode Island and he had a lot to do of shaping at least this part of Rhode Island, not so much. Who was the first governor of, uh, of Rhode Island? Benedict Arnold. Not that Benedict Arnold, <laughs> his grandfather. <laughs> okay. And you know we have the, the smallest state with the longest name, you know, it's Rhode Island and the Providence Plantations. Well, Roger had the Providence plantations, but Benedict had Rhode or Rogues Island, Newport. And that was the way they kind of divvied up the government here. So life was somewhat different in Newport than it was in what is today Providence. Um, but Roger was the biggest 
person to influence government and thinking about government because of his very strange views. So strange that when he first came here in 1631, he went, went down to Plymouth to preach, and he kept talking about religion as being something different than government. He didn't like that. Sent him up to Salem. Okay, actually, it's, he tried to go to Boston. They didn't want him there. So he goes to Salem. Spends another year there. Um, also comes up with these very strange ideas. So strange that the authorities in Boston said, we got to get this guy out of here. He's causing all kinds of trouble. And if people go along with him, we're in trouble as the church government. So they were about to send a whole militia up to get him out of his house, put him on a ship, and send him back to England in January 1636 when he got wind of it, booked out of his house, and walked. <laughs> Try walking from Salem to here, okay? In the worst winter that they had that time. It was so cold, the bay was frozen over solid, okay? I've been here 40 years, it's never been frozen over completely. So, by the time he got down to his old friend, Osamequins, Soames Village, he was in tough shape. Uh, could have died. And if you think about it, had Roger died right then, there would be no Providence, there would be no Rhode Island, and might not be any freedom of religion, okay? A lot of things could have turned out differently. But he survived because he got help from Margaret uh, over at Margaret's Cave. Anybody been there? Let me know if you want to go, and the next time we do a walk over there, it's just over the Swansea Warren line in uh, um, Swansea. Uh, Charlie McCoy owns the property, and he's happy to have people go there as long as they're in a, a group and not just going in there and spray painting the place. Um, that cave, if you want to call it, it's, you put some logs over it and you got a lean-to and there's a place for a fire in the back there and whatever. So the, the apocryphal story that the Roger Williams family tells is that that's where the native person named Margaret um, got uh, um, assisted uh, um, Roger in his recovery. And so after 14 weeks, uh, he left there and Osa Meekland said, this is the place you want to go, Omega Pond. Anybody been to the Roger Williams Memorial up there? I've never been there. Can't even find the thing. <laughs> uh, it's on Roger Williams Avenue in East Providence. Uh, if you check it out on the website, they'll give you directions there. But way at the back of this uh, one lot is a stone marker that reads like this and tells you that that's where Roger and his family uh, first thought they were going to start the new town until, of course, he got, he got his garden all planted and it was ready to go and he gets word from Plymouth that you're on our land, uh, King owns us, you got to get out of here. So he crosses the river uh, in the canoe and meets Canonicus, who at that time was now the Narragansett proprietor or chief of, of uh, that land. Anybody recall what he said? What cheer? Knee top? Okay, if you don't remember that, look at, look at any uh, province city truck. It will have what cheer on it. Okay, uh, and there at Slater, Slate, uh, Slate Rock, uh, he landed, so goes the story. I'm sure it got embellished along the way. But uh, they escorted him around to the other side of the, the bay to the Great Salt Pond there, which is now where we do water fire. And he set up camp there, brought more of his followers down. And over the course of the next 40 years or so, uh, became notorious as the guy who lorded over the cesspool of New England, filled with all kinds of radicals and ne'er-do-wells, people who did not go along with the authorities of the Bass Bay Colony, okay? Uh, so if they didn't like what you had to say, they sent you to Rhode Island, okay? It was like, the, it was like Australia, you know, the penal colony down here. 
But uh, that was where you read most of the, the uh, writings that he did at the time. And though he was not well known then, well after his death became much better known for his ideas. Also in East Providence, you can go to the Philip Walker House or the uh, Nathaniel Daggett House, which is just down the street from uh, this location in East Providence. Uh, two oldest houses in East Providence. Uh, rough look, well, this one, they did uh, dendrite studies and it may be like 1723, but at least an earlier part might have been, or 1700, but the Daggett House is about uh, 1690. There are only 10 houses that I could find prior to 1700 anywhere in this area. Um, here we are at the park where Rogers stayed. Uh, if you can uh, see the detail on this painting, this is a contemporary painting of what Providence might have looked like in 1650 with his settlement along the river. This would be North Main Street. Across the Great Salt Pond on this hill was Smith's Hill. What do we have there today? Huh? State, State House. House. Okay. And then back here is another high hill, Nudaconica Hill. Anybody been to Nudaconica Hill? Good for you. They used to have the only uh, uh, ski tow uh, almost in New England. They started it. Uh, yeah, for, for skiing. Yeah. yeah. It's a nice steep mountain. I think they stopped the skiing there because of too many accidents. Kids have gone off into trees and stuff like that. But for, for many years, that was a popular spot to go. It's the highest point in Providence. It's almost 300 feet. One of the highest points is not, not a size diamond hill. But, uh, um, that was the meeting place where, the, remember the map with the Nipmucks, the um, Narragansetts, the Poconocets, and uh, the Massachusetts, they would meet up there because it kind of was the intersection of their four tribal lands and have council up there and work out their use of product agreements about use of the land. And that's where Canonicus took Roger and said, you can have this land here. Okay, that's how he got Providence. Um, fascinating story there, and it goes along with, anybody recognize this bridge in Providence? I'll give you a clue. It's not 400 years old, but it's in a place that there's been a bridge since about 1660. That's the way Bossett Bridge. It's at the bottom of College Hill. Um, at this end of the bridge, you can see some nice interpretive markers there that give you the whole story. It shows you pictures of the different bridges. The reason this bridge is there, and this is the eighth version of a bridge that's been in exactly the same spot since 1660, is that that is and was the narrowest place of crossing. If you couldn't take a canoe across Narragansett Bay and wanted to walk, you would have to come up to this side of Huibasa Bridge and wade across at low tide uh, to be able to come over to this side of the river. Okay? Uh, so that was a significant place. The colonists, of course, built bridges, including a toll bridge that was run by none other than Roger Williams. <laughs> he, he had to make a living somehow. <laughs> so um, you can learn more about Providence and how it's laid out by going to the National Memorial there. I never understood Providence. It didn't make any sense to me. Once you see how, how it was settled early, uh, how Main, Main Street on, on the east side of the river uh, was the main town, and then they spread over the bridge and uh, first had farm fields there, but eventually built the rest of the city. So it, it all comes together there. This is a, a series of maps that uh, uh, that Van Edwards, anybody know Van? Yeah, <laughs> we were with him last night upstairs here. Uh, he did a fabulous job of discerning all, all the land changes, um, starting with Rehoboth, which was the first land cell. It was not the first in Plymouth, it was, uh, Taunton was the first one. But uh, 1641, 
uh, you had Rehoboth, and then Wanamoiset, who lives in Riverside. Uh, you seen the Wanamoiset marker? Yeah, it's right along Pawtucket Avenue there, next to the golf course, okay? It's the only indication that I can find of the 17th century, but that was the first purchase, uh, and uh, uh, then that got extended, uh, eventually becoming Swansea, so this whole area was Swansea, and then Barrington splits off from Swansea in uh, 1717, but then Warren acquires most of Barrington uh, just for a, a few years, and then finally in court uh, by, um, actually 1747, it was the boundary lines were finally settled. And I've always wondered why these boundary lines are so strange, because of this straight lines that don't follow rivers or any other natural feature. Well, I thought they must have been surveyed, right? I went and checked the survey map. <laughs> Somebody put a ruler down on the map and it just looked like that. So that's the boundary. So they go right through the middle of farm fields, you go over to Fort Town Farm and <laughs> try to figure out where the towns are. <laughs> okay, give you some idea of how crazy that layout was. But that was a settlement after a whole series of disputes for over 20 years as to who owned what and what were what was Swansea originally? What state? Massachusetts. Okay, and now we're Rhode Island. We didn't become Rhode Island until 17 actually 1746. I say 1747. Um, depends on whether you're going on the Julian calendar or not. Uh, but in any case. Uh, all of those deals reflected uh, different ownership of the land, different occupation of the land, and the ongoing battles because after all, land ownership was what everybody wanted, right? 1643, Newman Church. Drive by that? Okay. I've driven by it many times. I don't know what it was. 1643, okay, first English settlement in this area, a group from Weymouth came down, okay, with uh, Reverend Newman and started a church. You know the story in New England, you cannot have a town until you have a church. You cannot have a church until you have a pastor. You cannot have a pastor until you make a home for him, build him a house. So that's the sequence, and you'll see that again in Bristol. Uh, so they built them a, a place to live. Uh, they gathered the group. You can still see many of their remains, uh, uh, the gravesite across the street, uh, full of anybody, a re relative of a carpenter. Uh, chances are that your relatives are right there. Okay, um, Fascinating uh, location there, and one that the church just celebrated their 375th, uh, no, well, whatever, 43, Anyway, three, yeah. they yeah. just had an anniversary. <laughs> um, where, where was that church? Pardon me? Where is that church? On Newman Avenue. Oh, okay. <laughs> in East Providence. Oh, okay. right. yeah. yeah. If you go up to Pawtucket Avenue, I'm sure you've been on it. If, you, uh, if you've driven anywhere around the you know, know, East Providence. Rumford, connect? Well, yeah, it connects to Rumford. Rumford. Yeah, right. It's the Rumford area. Yeah, the. the the uh, Rumford uh, Mills are, are not far from there. Right. Were, um, not far also is Hunts Mills. Anybody been there? Good. Okay. I was just there over the weekend. Nice place, isn't it? Um, yeah. If you want a nice, relaxing place to get into nature and do that right in the middle of East Providence, you will be in there and swear you're in Maine. It's unbelievable in there. They have nice woods all along the 10 mile river that snakes along there, a very active river. And in that river, of course, they built dams to build mills in the 17th century there. So that first settlement there, was long before they were making baking powder, they were, they were uh, uh, weaving cloth and grinding uh, wheat and things of that sort. So it's, it's a, a nice place. And, and this, it's a one mile walk through the woods along the river. I definitely recommend it this even on a brisk day like this. Okay, you can actually see more with the fewer leaves on the trees. But I took my grandson over there over the weekend. 
He had a great time. Never seen a river before. <laughs> um, up in Rehoboth. How many people have tried going through Rehoboth? I used to avoid it. Why? I get lost every time. It's nothing but these little narrow roads going through the woods there. And you have no idea where you are. There's no high point. You can't look, you know. And without GPS, <laughs> it's difficult to explore. But if you get up there, go to the Carpenter Museum. Um, have you been there? Yeah, it's a fabulous little museum. Um, who's got some of those uh, tour guides there? The one for Rehoboth, uh, the yellow one. There's the yellow one right there. If you look at this picture, that's a picture of a kettle given uh, from uh, King Philip uh, uh, to uh, Benjamin Church uh, through Amalon, actually. Um, that's, we think, the original kettle uh, that he had at the time. That's in the Carpenter Museum there, along with a whole lot of other things. We've got a great exhibit of the Barneyville Shipyard. Okay, you know where that is? I do know where that is. Oh, right, yeah. Just over the Bungtown Bridge, as we call it, or the Miles Bridge, in a Barneyville Road, <laughs> okay, in Swansea. All right, it's, it's actually on the house. It's very good. Yeah. You have to go by there to right. There you go, okay. So <laughs> find out a little bit more about what was going on in Bungtown, because though that wasn't 17th century, that was 18th and 19th century, and that was a very important shipyard where they built all kinds of ships. Literally hundreds of ships were built there. And then launched from there at high tide. I know, how can they get a ship out of there? Um, there were no bridges then. And down to Warren where they were outfitted. And historically and unfortunately, a lot of them were outfitted as slave ships, which were then went to Bristol. Okay. But you had this entire shipbuilding industry going on there. I think Barneyville was a favorite spot because you had woods that were accessible on the Palmer River. Cut the trees, float them down, build the ships. Um, fab fabulous place, and that needs people need to know more about that. Back up in Rehoboth, there are mills, there are some signs available talking about some of the garrison houses they had during the King Philip War, but not a whole lot else. Speaking of the King Philip War, um, I'll give my five minute recitation of what happened in the King Philip War. This is from my um, original web page. Uh, I created this map to explain how living in this area, here we are, here we are in Barrington, right here, uh, Anawamskut, okay, um, and what was happening at the outbreak of the war was that Philip, you know the story of Philip, that his father died in 1661, the Massasoit Osmequin dies in 61. The lineage then goes to his oldest son, um, uh, Alexander, um, who then goes up to meet with the authorities in Plymouth, and on his way back, dies. The tribe to this day believes that he was poisoned. Well, the they, they got some evidence, they found the bill of sale for rat poison, which was a fairly common item in ships at the time, but it could have been used. Um, but more importantly, when you think about the politics, here's Osamequin, who dies keeping the peace for 50 years, and now the English, whose numbers have greatly increased, and the native population has greatly decreased, okay? By 1675, there were over 50,000 English people over here, and fewer than 7,000 native people here, okay? So, as those population changes took place, and the encroachment on land uh, resulted in an extraordinary amount of tension, and the English would love to have gotten out of that agreement from 1621, with Alexander out of the way, they would be able to simply occupy any remaining native land. So Alexander dies on his way back from Plymouth. Next thing, Philip, uh, by the way, these, these names uh, come, to, they, if you were gonna be a king at this time, you had an English name, you know, King Charles, 
okay, King James. Well, if you're going to be a king, a leader of the native tribes, you wanted to take an English name. So Philip and Alexander, anybody know their history, where those names came from? Macedonia. Pardon me? Macedonia. Macedonia, right. They were not Christian names, okay, and that was important. Uh, they, were, they were basically Greek names, if you will, and those names, and they were, uh, Alexander and Philip were brothers, so it applied to these two folks. So the English said, you can have these names. And so Philip, uh, who was Medicom, you know, Medicom Avenue? Okay, that was his original given name. Then he became Philip, or King Philip, okay, because he was the leader, the Massasoit of the tribe at the time. Well, here he is down here in his only remaining land on the Bristol Peninsula. Meanwhile, you've got English settlements, so we talked about along Kekimuit, over in uh, Swansea, uh, Swansea Corner, uh, the garrison up here at Miles Corner and Knockham Hill was another one of those settlements. There's one up on the Ruins River, Ruins River there. Um, uh, we also had them uh, down in Warwick, up in Providence, uh, up the Blackstone with the uh, I remember Blackstone came there actually a little before uh, um, Williams. And then Newport, which was at that time uh, a very thriving. Newport was one of the four biggest uh, cities on the East Coast at the time. Uh, so you're down to from 7,000, well, probably at the, at the turn of the century, 1600. Probably around 70, 70 to 100,000 Native people living here. By the time of the war, there were 7,000. By the end of the war, there were 700. Okay, so that's how much the population went down. So he's stuck, surrounded by these Native people. Uh, they're wanting more and more to encroach on his land. The easiest way to obtain land, if you're an English person, is to get a farm, get some pigs, and don't do a good job of keeping them corralled. Um, pigs or cows will go in and not only eat native corn and whatever other food supplies they have, but they devastate the land, uh, tear the place up. And then, of course, the native people would remove or leave that land and the English would occupy it. So there's an awful lot about this. If you, if you want to read more of, uh, about that, uh, uh, there's a whole a book about uh, Sassamon and the uh, um, what happened just before the war. But what we do know is that Philip, who had been occupying land not at Mount Hope itself, but a little further north, uh, that was the Mount Hope settlement, uh, where uh, the Narrows is now. If you go down Narrows Road in Bristol, you'll find it at the end there. It's, we know it was well occupied because they, they've done archaeological digs there. And probably people have been living there for thousands of years over time. But Philip was down there. Uh, the war breaks out uh, in Warren. You know where the Kikamuot Middle School is? Uh, on Child Street? You know where the dam is at the Kikamuot River? It's by the water plant. Yeah, yeah, by the, yeah, by Bristol County Water Authority where we all don't get our water from today. <laughs> that was the most likely lo location of uh, Joe Winslow's farm, uh, where uh, uh, the colonists were at church. Um, uh, some native men come in and start looting the farm. A 12-year-old boy uh, shoots one of them in the arm, draws blood. That was the sign that the first one to draw blood would lose the war. You know, so, um, Next thing you know, uh, they're over in Swansea uh, burning the farms. And word goes up to Boston, uh, the militia comes down, gathers uh, right there at the uh, end of Barneville Road uh, where the Miles Garrison House was, and about 300 troops. And after several days, and you could read all the detail of this, they finally decide they're going to go down and, and find uh, Philip uh, down at his home in Bristol. Well, do you think after three days, uh, Philip was just going to sit there and wait for the British to come? Of course not. <laughs> he had long ago booked. He took off uh, across where the um, Malgo Bridge is, went over to Tiverton and got some help from 
Wiedemo, uh, the uh, Pagasa chief, and uh, went up through the Maori Pass and up along uh, the east side of the, um, the uh, North uh, Watapa Pond. It was just up there last week. <laughs> and a crossover at uh, Winslow Point uh, on the Taunton River. They had machines or uh, um, canoes there. It was a ferry, so you had, you had canoes on both sides. And when you wanted to go one way, you took a canoe, and when you came back, you took it back. You know, so. It was easy for a group of people to cross there, which they did. Headed all the way out, up, all the way as far as Deerfield, um, burned over 25 um, towns, uh, killed over 2,500 colonists. Uh, I'm sorry, 1,500 colonists, but 2,500 Native people died in that war. Which, if you look at the map, looks and and you read what uh, um, both Massasoit and um, Philip uh, said about that. They were going to lose their whole culture if they didn't do something. And you, you know, you can't justify war, but you can understand the motivation, and you can understand what they were trying to do simply to drive the English back to England. Some of them went back during the war. Others went down to Newport, which at the time was uh, Narragansett uh, controlled territory. So it looked like uh, things weren't going to work out well for the colonists until the winter. Here's the whole route of the battles, all the way on up. Uh, you go up to Turner's Falls, there's a nice monument up there to a massacre. Uh, you know about the Great Swamp Fight? Mm -hmm. And yeah, you've probably heard of that. That was in December of 1675, down in a swamp in, in South County. And uh, you can go there, but it's not much to look at. Um, Don't they crawl out the King Philip Swamp? Uh, it's all, it's, all I know is the Great Swamp. Great, it's, I think it's, 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 yeah. I think that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, there are a lot of monuments to King Philip all over the place, including not up into New Hampshire. Uh, so it, Philip had a lot of influence over the whole area. He engaged other tribes in the war. It wasn't just the, um, the uh, Poconocets, but also there were tribes, as I was mentioning earlier, out of the Cape, who sided with the English. So it wasn't simply English against the tribes, it was some tribes against other tribes and the English and other allies. So it was, a, like most wars, a complicated story there. The war ended in 1676 with the death of Philip down at Mount Hope. You can go, and there's a marker there in the Mary Swamp. Just go to the office at uh, Mount Hope Farm and ask for directions and you can take the two mile walk down the road and find the marker in the woods. Um, the people who didn't, who survived the war were either then executed or driven from the area or uh, enslaved and sent to Barbados. Um, when, why send people to Barbados? Well, if you enslave a native person in this area and you say, you know, you've got to stay in here. What happens at three in the morning? Yeah, they're gone. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> they're not going to stick around for that. And uh, but in Barbados, they didn't know anybody couldn't go anywhere, etc. And they've actually traced the genetic uh, in, uh, DNA inheritance uh, in Barbados people there. So that, that tribe is now reconnected with their their relatives in, in Barbados. Well. The places that you can see around here, it's all on the website and all in the uh, uh, brochure. What we're building here is a case for a heritage area. How many people have been to the Blackstone Valley heritage area between uh, Tuckett and Worcester? Okay, And you know that that heritage area is, they do have the Slater Mill and now they have the Museum of Work and Culture. But it's basically a lot of little spots along the Blackstone River, okay? Great places, a lot of historic interest, but uh, like all heritage areas around the country, it's simply a, uh, um, a trail, if you will, to all those places. And then Helen said, you know, why can't we do the same thing down here? We've got a lot of these small locations. We don't have the Grand Canyon, we, you know, we don't have Niagara Falls, but we have early history, and in particular, the, the most pivotal history 
in terms of English settlement here, and that was the relationship with the Poconosa tribe and the, the, the way the use of the land changed in that hundred years. So that's the concept, to put together a heritage area that will encompass all of these sites. Uh, this is the Miles Garrison and the marker next to it. Here's the, the uh, place where Philip was killed in the Mary Swamp on Mount Hope Farm. Um, some of the other places up in Rehoboth, Anamon Rock. Uh, Anna, Chief Anamon was uh, killed there by Benjamin Church uh, at the end of the war. Um, unfortunately, uh, he wasn't killed there. He was captured there and then taken to Plymouth and killed. Um, Church spent the night before exchanging war stories, so I, I guess there was, you know, uh, this friendship among <laughs> generals, right? Um, but you can go up to the rock there. Here's other places around here. Um, over in Swansea, the, you can't get to this now. The family doesn't want people there, but there are historic cemeteries all over the place. They're all on the website. Um, closest one here is uh, uh, Tyler Point. Been down to Tyler Point. This is John Miles. That's uh, the guy who settled up there at Knockham Hill. Okay, that's not his actual grave. It's a monument to him, but they think he's buried there. And if we ever get some help in the future, maybe we'll find the gravesite at some point. Uh, this is my favorite over in Warren and on Serpentine Road, uh, the Kikamute uh, Cemetery there, with graves of men who fought in the King Philip War. Okay. Um, Another favorite over here in the Riverside, Ancient Little Neck Cemetery. Anybody been there? Good. Okay, people who live there and do that. Um, fascinating cemetery, very difficult to find. Use GPS, there's a map in the, on the website and uh, it'll get you there. Uh, but uh, not only is uh, Tom Willett, who started, remember, Juana Moisa Purchase back in 1643, he, he was a member of the Newman Church who got that first land purchase. He's buried there. And he had become the mayor of New York City, not just once, but twice, primarily because he spoke Dutch. Remember, New Amsterdam was Dutch. Okay. But he's from here, okay, and buried here. Another person is Elizabeth Tilly, who grew up in England at the age of 12, goes to Leiden, uh, from Leiden comes over to Plymouth, Lands here, survives somehow. He's one of the, one of the 52 survivors of that group, um, and, and then eventually marries John Holland. Okay, and they live together. Have uh, a family. You can go to the Holland house up in, in Plymouth, see where they lived. Then the King Philip War breaks out, and their house gets burned. Okay, with King Philip War, she survives that and ends up moving in with her sister over in what's now Riverside and lives out her life there and dies and that's why she's buried in Riverside. Uh, it's a great story. If you go online, uh, look for uh, Dave Norton who, who does a whole uh, two-hour history of, uh, of Elizabeth Tilly. Uh, but uh, somebody needs to make a featured movie out of that. It's a, it's a great story. Um, and then some of the open spaces around here up, uh, not far from uh, uh, the uh, um, Hunts Mills in East Providence is the Brigham Farm area. Um, that's a great place to walk. It's along next to the river and there's a dam over there. It's also a, what we think is a 400 year old oak tree right on the edge of that property. Um, this is Chase Farm on the north end of uh, Warren, not far from where Margaret's Rock and Cave is. Okay. Uh, this was a King's Grant. Uh, uh, they, uh, the farm was given to, awarded to them by the King of England. <laughs> okay, so you get some idea. And it's been in continuous family occupation ever since. Fabulous stuff. You should recognize some of these. Um, Solmes Woods and Echo Lake here in Barrington. If you haven't gone there, it's a wonderful place. Um, there, uh, Hampton uh, Meadows and um, Greenway, uh, right in the center of uh, down here, where are we? Just over there, uh, not far from here. You can walk from here to there. Okay, uh, great place for a nature preserve. Uh, fortunately, it's a great place for kids to get to the Solms Elementary School. 
So you don't see them on the street, they're in the woods going to school there. And if you're down in Bristol, um, Wake Posset Preserve, um, which was land set aside and now it's town land, uh, never been occupied, colonized, if you will. Great woods, beautiful brook running through it. And that brook runs down to the Narrows where we know there were native settlements for thousands of years there. So if you want a little taste of what life might have been like 400 years ago, go there. Um, my uh, chief <laughs> pursuit <laughs> is to find out information about this rock. You know Johnson's Market on Route 136? Anybody been there? Okay, you've probably all driven by it at some point. It's a, only one of two ways you can get in or out of Warren. <laughs> okay. um, right across from the street sits this perched rock or boulder there. Um, just, it's, you can see it better now because the, uh, the stuff has, uh, the leaves are gone, so you can see through the fence. But notice that the next time you drive by, go on 45 miles an hour, <laughs> okay. Uh, but it's on private property. But uh, I kept looking at that and looking at that and saying, you know, I, I talked to the state archeologist Tim Ives and he said, Tim, what is this? Says, well, that's a glacial erratic. I said, yeah, I know. <laughs> the glaciers brought lots of large stones down, left them all over the place. No, glaciers don't put stones, uh, don't prop the stones up. There's the stone with those other stones around the outside. He said, human beings did that. And I said, I think that's a native ceremonial rock. He said, well, we don't know. I have no way. He says, if you can find somebody who can tell me that, maybe I'll take a look. Well, I'm looking Philbrick, and looking. Daniel Philbrick refers to that rock in, in his book. That rock or the one across the street at King's Rock? This the one that's... Okay. The Perch Rock? Yeah. I'll have to reread Philbrick then. Yeah, in Mayflower. I'm going to have to see his feet. Because they're both... This is King's Rock. This is on the west side of the street. This is on the east side of the street. Just, just south. Tim Johnson, who owns Johnson's Market, owns this half of the rock, okay, some private property, and uh, uh, Sue D'Alessandro uh, owns this is D'Alessandro farm there, okay, uh, Sue Lansbach actually her names. Uh, but this isn't just a rock somewhere, this is a large rock that is placed on bedrock at the top of a mound known historically as Sachem's Knoll, Okay, across from King's Rock, which is described as the national grinding stone of the native, where Native American women used to roll a large rock along a groove, which you can still go up there and see, to grind corn. And it's also within sight of Margaret's Rock, and we think that was a native settlement at the time. So we've got all these pieces to put together, that this isn't just a glacial erratic just happened in the last year. Okay, there's a story going on here. And I again, I spoke with the archaeologist last night and said, I've been talking to every archaeologist I could find and none of them will give me a straight answer. Mm. And it turns out mass archaeology has a policy, I have it in writing, that says we will never comment about native ceremonial <laughs> locations. Okay, sorry. Okay, so they don't even answer your email. <laughs> right. Um, and, what about and, a geologist, though? Because that, that the, that's a the ledge rock. rock looks like it's a, a different kind of... Yeah, this, this is a granite outcropping. That's, that's a... Uh, it's very the, typical of, of the erratics that are around where that. But the rock that's, the stone that's being used as a wedge looks yep. like it's different than both of them. Oh, is this it? one? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, more than likely. But what's it, the geologist is going to say, this is this kind of stone, this is that kind of stone. And they will be able to say nothing about its meaning. And that's what I'm trying to get at. Well, if somebody carried it from a long way to bring it, there's... Yeah, and as Tim know. says, ah, oh, could have been a couple of college kids. I that's said, look, Tim, college kids have a lot better things to do than roll on a two-time print up, rock up a hill. Why won't Come we on. Be answers? Pardon me? Why won't the archaeologists be answers? Their basic uh, point of view is that if there isn't any prominence of uh, the there's no way of knowing historically what it was. It's not written down somewhere. They'll even accept a tribal story if it's been corroborated. 
And I'm trying to get the Narragansett historian, uh, Doug Harris, to come up and look at it. Well, oh, haven't you, uh, you talked to the Poconoco? Oh, I work with them all the time. They don't know. They don't right. know. Yeah, I, had, uh, I went to uh, hear some of the yep. guys are in their 80s and early the young guys, and the elders at the um, church down the street there. Yep. I'm new to Rhode <laughs> so, Okay, uh, yeah. But at any rate, I, I, probably because of the big uh, rift in culture and stuff lost, I was well, sure that stuff is lost, but I just wondered if they might have been able to I, that, that was the first group I asked, mm -hmm. and they know nothing. Remember, <laughs> Speaking of that loss, that die-off, the great dying in 1616, 1619, they lost a lot of their culture. You know, it's it's like, you know, our, I don't know, losing our great libraries, losing our, our great museums. I mean, everything they knew was in the heads of the people living there, and most of them died. So, well, it's the same story all over the country, just depend. I worked extensively yep. with, uh, in California trying to restore, fortunately some of the stuff happened in later, you had uh, uh, scholars like Harrington who put a lot of stuff in the Smithsonian and you can go back with some of the elders and piece it together. But it's very right. difficult to get the feds or the states to recognize. Uh, so even if you got the information the, from the, somebody, the, probably What the native people, people around here have done is read the English account of history and then they get their interpretation of that history. That's the best they have to go on. Yeah. Um, I, I worked in D.C. for a number of years ago. Mm -hmm. And, and one, of, one of the agencies we worked with, with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, there are laws in, on the books, basically, about, uh, you know, the, I think are backing up what, what your account is saying, is that we will defer to the tribes on, right. on their oral history. Yep. And, and, and as a matter of fact, I was kind of floored that uh, the official policy is that well, even though it's an oral tradition and some of the treaty might, might not be known, that we'll defer to what the tribe says they were. Right. So, so it's basically a, a hands-off attitude that we are not going to step on their toes. Yeah. And from that point of view, it's understandable. Yeah. Then the question is, how do you fight somebody from a tribe who knows something? No, well, that, that's a problem where, right. where, where, where you've lost the continuity. Yes. But I, I, know, I know, you know, working with the BIA and some of the tribes, they're pretty fierce about defending their own version of the history. Sure, yeah. well, and why shouldn't they be? I've been there a lot longer. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, these are places you can see that you're going by every day. Uh, this is behind uh, Swansea Town Hall, this is Abrams Rock. We were just up there a couple weeks ago. Uh, this is at Mount Hope. This is uh, on the Massasoit seat, or King Philip seat. Uh, this is up on Newtoconicut Hill. This is a place where the tribes gathered for council up there. Bristol became English territory once the war was over. Okay, the king simply granted the land to them. It was given to four proprietors from Boston who then sold that land to pay off war debts. Okay, and then Bristol was laid out. It's the only uh, town in Rhode Island laid out on a grid like this. Kind of interesting. Um, some of the older houses in Bristol, this is uh, the, um, the Nathaniel Bosworth House, otherwise called the Perry Rigo House, um, but this is what it was like a hundred years ago. Uh, that was, remember I said to have a town you had to have a minister, well to get a minister you had to build a parsonage, so they built this as a parsonage. They brought the wood over from England, uh, built the parsonage, and then were able to build a meeting house on the town common, and then they could have a town. So it took them four years. Um, and if you go in the little museum there at the church, uh, uh, there's a pew in from that early church, some of the chalices and some of the early uh, pastors, uh, they're not buried there next to the church, but that's the grave markers. You know, all the, all the 1,700 burials in Bristol are in the town common underneath the playground. <laughs> and they, then they moved all the markers across the street. <laughs> Interesting way to handle it. Um, two other uh, houses, the Joseph Reynolds House on Hope Street, and then uh, one part of Elm Farm. Um, those are the only three, that, those in the Bosworth House, the only three pre-1700 houses in Bristol. Right around here, of course, Martin House, you know where this is, the 
you know the white church, you know the bridge across they just redid? Well, the house at the end of the bridge is the Joseph Martin house, and there are at least parts of that prior to 1700, uh, 1680 in some accounts, but all depends on who you talk to, right? Mm -hmm. um, coming into Warren, uh, the Hale Noons Farm house, the big yellow house at the top of the hill, across from Choppies in you know, Warren. Um, over in Swansea, uh, though the um, John Martin House uh, there uh, says 1728, uh, we think that the earl there was an earlier structure prior to 1700. That's according to uh, Carl Becker from the Swansea Historical Society. Only existing 1700 house or 17th century houses, the Hunt House in Seekonk, and then the Kingsley House over Rehoboth. Only 10 houses I could find in these eight towns uh, that uh, are prior to 1700. So here we are back again to behind my house where they're reburying the Massasoit. Uh, the story goes that he was uh, dug up along with 41 other grave sites in Burse Hill uh, because Charles Carr, the town librarian and amateur archaeologist, got tired of people looting all the graves and digging stuff up and taking it home. That started in 1854 when the railroad was built. It's now the East Bay bike path that goes along one side of Burse Hill Park. So those items, Charles either kept some in the, at his little museum on the second floor of the George Hill Library in Warren, or uh, sold them or shipped them to uh, Brown, Harvard, uh, Hay Museum in New York, whatever, they're all over the place. But in uh, uh, 2000, I'm going to get the date wrong, anyway, early 2000s, uh, we passed the Native American uh, Burial Site Reclamation Act. Yeah, the Repatriation Act. What year was it? Yeah. Uh, but uh, so the, the Mashpee tribe, who had just gotten uh, federal recognition in 2007, not the Cape, even though they were not the original occupiers of this place, and the Poconoke tribe who were, were not very happy, but they were able to go claim, reclaim all these over 600 items got permission from the town. Two years ago in May, uh, dug a hole, put a, a vault, a concrete vault in the ground, uh, had a ceremony and uh, rededicated and reburied those items there, had a celebration in the park. And that's how the Massasoit got behind my house, which is what started this whole thing. <laughs> so here's the tribe today. Uh, this is the Sagamore Bill guy that lives in Barrington. Okay, does anybody know him? Better, yeah, know. yeah, he's a nice guy, and uh, they do uh, uh, still have uh, powwows. Uh, their biggest celebration is down on Mount Hope Farm in uh, the end of June, the Strawberry Harvest Festival, Thanksgiving, uh, and they have over 300 people who come to that. So, if anybody ever tells you that Native people are no longer here, tell them they're wrong. Okay, there's been a concerted effort for over 150 years in this country to tell everybody that Native people are gone. Okay, not true. Right. And, <laughs> yeah. and, and people say, well, how do you know they're here? I said, well, you don't. You have to ask them. You know, if you saw these people in the grocery store, would you say, oh, that's a Native person? No, they look like anybody else. Come on. Well, in fact, they do run into them in Shaw or something. Yeah, there you go. Right. They're just like everybody else. Hello, folks. Uh, but they have an important history and story to tell, and I've been working with them to help tell that story. And if we are successful, we'll tell that story through a heritage area for here. Oh, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Okay.